1851, the stereoscope captured the awe of Londoners by producing something called natural magic, a scientifically produced illusion that turned two photographs into a 3D experience. Well, 165 years later, we've advanced in technology and can now actually have this illusion change in front of us by replacing this piece of paper with a display. And not only that, we can actually interact with this illusion itself, pushing it to the brink of reality. Today, we call this virtual reality. And I'm here to tell to you today about the next generation of VR, one where by carefully engineering the virtual world, we can not only make the illusion more realistic, but in some cases, we can actually make it better and clearer than the real world itself. Now, this is important as VR applications extend past their current ones in education, in simulation, in medicine, where they start replacing the TVs and monitors in everyone's homes and workplaces. It's important that everyone sees a clear image like this one and not something like this. But to understand where this comes from, we have to understand our visual system. When we look around the real world, our eyes perform two actions. They verge and they accommodate. Virgin simply refers to the relative rotation of our eyeballs in their socket. So if I hold up my finger like this, my eyes rotate inwards. And Virgin is driven by something called binocular disparity. And we all experience this every day. It's just a relative shift between the images that our eyes perceive. So I actually want everyone to hold up their finger like this in front of them and look at it with one eye. And now switch between it, switch between your eyes while you look at your finger. You should see that your finger appears to shift but you're not actually moving your finger, right? And this is exactly binocular disparity at play. Your eyes view two different perspectives of the same world. And these two things together, vergence and binocular disparity, they make up something that we call stereo cues that give us a great sensation of depth in the world. We get a lot of information from the world about, with these cues. We can tell how far the car in front of us is, the tree when we're skiing, or the ball being kicked at our head. And these two things is exactly what, virg uh, what virtual reality currently exploits. But what about accommodation, the second action that our eyes perform? Accommodation is just the focus state of our eye. When I look at my finger, light bounces off of it, passes through my lenses, and falls onto my retina, the sensor of our visual system. Well, these lenses in our eyes, they bend so that this image that's formed on my retina is clear. This is how we see the world clearly. Now, again, one more time, I want everyone to hold up their finger in front of them like this and look at it. Hopefully, you can see your finger clearly. But you'll notice that everything behind it is blurred out, right? And this is something that we call retinal blur. And for those of you in the photography community, this is better known as a depth of field effect. They're the exact same thing. And our brain, our visual system, actually uses this blur to drive our focus to whatever object that we're looking at, the same that an autofocus mechanism inside of a camera operates. Well, why am I telling you this? Why do we care about vergence and accommodation? Well, VR just attempts to mimic or simulate the real world. So for it to be convincing and immersive, it has to be able to invoke both of these actions in our visual system. Unfortunately, today's current generation displays, VR headsets, are only able to implement one of these and not the other, leading to not only not particularly realistic experience, but one that can actually be a source of sickness and uncomfort. So to understand this, let's look at a generic model of a VR headset. Most structures, most headsets on the market follow this type of structure. There's some sort of phone, typically, uh, some sort of display, typically a phone, that emits light. The light then passes through two lenses and finally falls onto our eyes. So the two things that make VR so immersive is that they provide a very large field of view. These lenses bend the light in such a way that fills up everything that we can see. And the second is that they support stereo cues, this vergence and binocular disparity that I was just talking about. We can simulate these two cues and gain a great sensation of depth in the scene by displaying a different image to each eye, something like this. The left eye sees the left portion of the screen, the right eye sees the right portion. And if you look carefully, there's a small perspective shift between that becomes more apparent when I overlap the two images. And this is actually my advisor back at Stanford. So if I were to actually put this stimulus on a VR headset and look to him, my eyes would verge as if he was only two meters away. Luckily, he's back in California, 
I don't have to worry about him right now. <laughs> um, but this is the amazing thing about VR. It can support these virgins and binocular disparities so that we feel that the things around us are actually physically there. But what about accommodation, the focus state of our eye? I should mention that these lenses do a separate, a second thing. They actually magnified each portion of the screen that our eyes see, blow it up, and place it some distance away. The distance of this magnified image changes from product to product, but it's typically around one and a half meters. So you can imagine that when you put on one of these displays, you just really see a giant blown up screen placed some distance away. So to see the screen clearly, we have to focus to it. We focus to this one and a half meters. If you were to focus in front of or behind it somehow, we'd just see a blurry image, right, because of this retinal blur depth of field. So in fact, when we put on one of these VR headsets, our focus is driven to this one plane, this one and a half meters. But that's not very realistic. I mean, in the real world, I can focus between my finger and you, but in this virtual world, I can only focus to this one distance. And it turns out this is the exact cause of sickness that I mentioned earlier. In the real world, when we look around a scene, our eyes both verge and accommodate our focus to the same object, the same distance. Our brain has done this from birth, and this is what it expects to see. But in these VR headsets, we can verge anywhere, but we can only focus to one plane. And it turns out our brain gets confused. It's never done this before. And we've evolved in such a way where when our brain gets confused, it thinks it's poisoned. We develop nausea, we get eye strain, we, get, uh, we just become fatigued in general. And in, if you look at the terms VR hangover, VR sickness, this is one of the serious contributors to those symptoms. And it's gone to the point where people are taking drugs to fix something that they inflicted on themselves by putting on one of these VR headsets, which is completely beyond me. So my colleagues and I at Stanford have developed a new display technology where we're able to relink the virgins and accommodative systems in a rather simple and effective way. And we call it adaptive focus. So here's a Samsung Gear VR that we hacked into to develop this idea. We added eye trackers to the system and equipped it with a motor that is able to move the phone screen back and forth. Well, small changes in the distance between the phone screen and the lens actually results in very large distances in the magnified image. And remember, our focus is fixed to the distance of this magnified image. So as we change the position of it, we actually allow a user to refocus in a scene. So by combining this idea with the eye tracker, knowing the position of the eye, we can actually update the position of the magnified image so that it aligns with the position of whatever object a user is looking at in the scene. A person can now verge and focus to the exact same distance, just like they do in the real world. And this is more realistic and more comfortable than the current state of the art, where you can only verge, well, we can verge anywhere, we can only focus to the one plane. So the industry is rapidly trying to move towards these new, re more realistic displays that allow users to refocus. But just moving towards that blindly, I'll argue, is not the correct solution. The real world isn't that great for everyone, especially people over the age of 45. Now, as we grow with age, these lenses in our eyes that allow us to refocus, well, they stiffen, reducing the range over which we can see clearly. Now, a child might be able to focus between 10 centimeters and infinity. Someone over the age of 45 might only be able to focus between one and two meters. And this condition is called presbyopia. And it's typically treated with bifocal lenses that you can see here, or progressive lenses, or something called monovision. So, the unfortunate thing about presbyopia, and the reason why every single one of you should care, is that at some point in, in your life, everyone gets affected by presbyopia. By the age of 45, people start developing symptoms, and by the age of 55, everyone has it. Everyone has full onset presbyopia. So now that uh, hopefully you're interested, uh, <laughs> let's see what a presbyope might see in the real world. We know that a presbyope can only see within a clear, within a short range. They can see clearly within the short range. So they can see the square, square well, but if they look to the circle or the star, they try to focus there, but their lenses just aren't flexible enough. So they can't see the object clearly. And if we just recreate the real world blindly, we just reintroduce the exact same problem. They can see the square clearly, but they can't see the circle or the star. 
but what if I like stars? I want to see the blue star. So let's see how bad this blur really is. You can see that as this target moves very close to the user, it gets pretty significantly blurred out if it moves outside of this focus range of the presbyope. And you know, this is a pretty large target, so you can still make it out. But if I were to put small text there, like a book in front of you, you wouldn't be able to see anything clearly. It turns out that if we only correct for the prescription of the presbyope and fix the virtual image or the magnified image within their clear focus range, they can see the whole scene clearly, regardless of the depth of the object they're looking at. And yes, technically, this is a non-realistic way of showing the world, right? But this is what we were trying to get away from. It turns out that people that, have, that are presbyopic, they kind of experience this conflict between their virgins and accommodation on a day-to-day -day basis. And they aren't affected by the symptoms as much. So giving them a non-realistic stimulus like this one is actually better than the real world. They don't get sick, and they can see objects at any depth clearly. And we can take this idea of engineering the virtual world and apply it to near and far-sighted people as well. We can dial in their prescriptions and virtually or optically place the whole virtual image, either bring it in or bring it out, so that they can see everything without the need of glasses, without the need of contacts or surgery. And this idea of engineering the virtual world is what I want to emphasize and conclude with. By engineering the virtual world, we can correct for whatever problems people have in the real one if they need it. Of course, if someone is you know, young and has 20-20 vision, just make the virtual world as close to the real one as possible. The real world turns out to be pretty good for them. But if someone is presbyopic, don't recreate it perfectly. Do it in a way where they can see the best possible image. And if someone is near or farsighted, dial in their prescriptions so they can wear these displays, these systems, without the need of their prescription. And the amazing thing is this extends past just the visual system. VR systems are multimodal. And to be totally immersive, we have to simulate the sense of touch, smell, sound, movement, and gravity. And I can see a time in the future where by engineering each of these systems to account for the shortcomings of each and every person, we can come to a scenario where the virtual world might actually be better than the real one itself. Thank you.